It's Wednesday, December 19th. Welcome to Market Foolery. I'm Chris Hill. Joining me in studio today from Motley Fool Pro, Brian Hinman, and from Motley Fool Stock Advisor, Joe Tenebruso. Good to see you guys. Hey, Chris. Thank Chris. you for being here. This is our last one of the year. Uh-oh. So, so what I say that for two reasons. One, to put the pressure on you guys, like make it good. Got to bring the A game. You always, you I know brought what? fireworks. <laughs> fireworks in an A game. I love it. Uh, but, but mainly I say that. For our dozens of listeners out there, yes, this is the last market foolery of 2012. We are going to take a break over the holidays, just like we did last year. We will be back on January 2nd. And let me say this up front. Uh, for those of you who subscribe to this podcast through iTunes, as most of you do, you're going to have to click the resubscribe button. So make a little reminder to yourself, a post it note, something in your calendar on your computer. Just remind yourself to resubscribe to Market Foolery on iTunes on January 2nd. All right. Uh, As we did yesterday when we were talking with Bill Mann and Tim Hansen, uh, we're going to wrap up the year with a little bit of a look back at 2012, but also look forward to 2013, sort of get your your thoughts on uh, what you guys are watching in the year to come. But let's start by looking back a little bit at 2012. And yesterday on the podcast, we were talking about Facebook. Um, A lot of people, for legitimate reasons, look at Facebook and say, you know what, when it comes to investing, when it comes to stocks, that is really the major story of 2012. Uh, But Brian, I'll just start with you. Um, Are you going with that as well? Or do you have something else that you think this is a significant story that when you think of 2012, this is going to be one of the things you remember? So Facebook was big, but I don't think it touched uh, all investors quite like uh, low bond yields. I mean, 10-year treasuries right now are yielding 2%. And so, when you sort of assume that the the going rate of inflation is above 2%, uh, that's a negative real yield. So, if you buy a 10-year government bond right now, uh, you're going to be worse off than you were 10 years from now. Uh, That has serious implications for long-term investors who are looking for security and who are looking for uh, income. And so, you know, that's sort of my story of 2012, is that... uh, Bond yields, the price of safety, yeah. uh, are in- so incredibly low right now. But conversely, uh, if you look at the dividend yields of you know some blue chip bulletproof stocks, stocks like uh, Paychex, uh, uh, Waste Management, Microsoft, Cisco, uh, Cisco the the food purveyor, not uh, the router and switching company. I mean, you're talking yields, uh, dividend yields close to four percent right now uh, versus 2% for, for treasuries. And th- those dividend yields are going to grow over time. And so I think it's important for investors to step back and realize that you know risk isn't volatility. Risk isn't that the price is going to go up and down. If you're looking at a 10-year horizon like you are if you buy a 10-year treasury, um, your principal is probably pretty safe in these blue chip you know, bulletproof stocks. Along the way, you're going to get a higher dividend yield, and those dividends are going to grow. So investors really need to step back and uh, you know think about uh, where they want to be putting their money in it for for the long term. That's a great point that Bill Mann touched on that a little bit yesterday. Just for him, the whole notion of uh, the role of the Federal Reserve, the quantitative easing, and this whole notion of you know as I put it, free money forever. Um, and you make a great point, particularly for for people. And a lot of people work with a financial advisor at some point. And you know, Joe, I know when I was growing up, the whole notion of like, oh, you know, you want to be in bonds. You got to have like forty percent in bonds, and you know, and that sort of thing. And it just seems like, you know, to Brian's point, when you look at the returns over the next few years, that that just seems like it's going to be um, something that's not going to pay out. Certainly, the way it has in the past. When you look back at 2012, what stands out for you? For me, it's just that, you know, from a high-level view, with all the uncertainty and fear that was out there surrounding Europe and the fiscal cliff more recently, uh, the market's still up about 15% on the year. Yeah. And I think that just goes to show investors that we can't wait for an all-clear signal. I mean, for one thing, it's probably never going to happen. The market's never going to say, okay, now's the time to buy. But, you know, even, even when things do start to look good, by then, the prices probably already reflect that. So, I think investors just need to keep that in mind going forward. Um, I, I was thinking about this the other day, I, and uh, I, we'll move to looking ahead to 2013. Uh, to your point about, you look back over the last year, the market was up. We did have these significant uh, macro events going on with Europe right now with the fiscal cliff, these, these huge uncertainties. And despite that, people were putting money into the market, bidding up stocks, et cetera. Um, I sort of feel like, gosh, if we can just get past the fiscal cliff, as most people think we will, 
uh, at some point, whether it is before December 31st or shortly thereafter. Um, when you look at housing in the U.S. and all of the indicators in the housing market, it uh, again, I don't want to get too over-enthusiastic, but it really seems like 2013 is setting up to be a great year to be investing in stocks. That's actually my key trend to watch for 2013, Chris, is the continued recovery of the housing market. Um, it's such a huge part of the economy, especially the new housing market, which is a great creator of jobs. And like you said, all well, not all signs, but a lot of the evidence right now points to continued recovery, and it's something I'll be watching closely next year. When it comes to investing in stocks to take advantage of the housing market, obviously you can. There's a pretty wide range, everywhere from you know the the home builders themselves to the Home Depots, the Lowe's, the um, to even a company you mentioned, Brian, uh, Waste Management, um, because housing starts and trash correlate pretty nicely together. Um, is is there a particular area, Joe, that you like to look at? Uh, when it comes to groups of stocks, um, or or do you just sort of step back and and look at that whole range? In terms of the housing market, yeah, I mean, for you personally, when you you know, like we all have our areas of competence, we all sure. have those areas where we feel like, okay, I'm I'm drawn to this industry as opposed to that industry. Where do you look? The companies that I look for most are typically are consumer oriented. I feel like I have more of an edge there. I start with uh, kind of like a David Gardner approach where. You know, if I have an excellent customer experience with a company, if I really like their products or services, that that could be a starting point for me. It's it's not the be all and end all by any means, because we've seen in the past that some companies can have tremendous products but turn out to be kind of disasters in terms of their business model. But companies, and I'm talking about here, are like Under Armour or Boston Beer. Yep. Um, you know, companies where you enjoy the products, you have a familiar. Uh, so you had a great consumer experience with Boston <laughs> Beer. <laughs> I've, I've had some good times. I've had some good times. So I, I think that that's approach uh, investors, particularly beginning investors, can kind of use and, and understand. Brian, what is something? What's to Joe's point about a trend that he's watching in twenty thirteen? What's what's a trend that you're watching? You know, so Facebook was a huge story in in twenty twelve, yep. right? And uh, part of the reason that Facebook is such a battleground stock is because people aren't sure um, whether or not social media in general uh, has real value. To businesses, and so I think next year. So it's important to know that Facebook has built a pretty incredible business, even though uh, you know advertising via social media isn't yet proven in. Uh, I think 2013 is going to take a big step in the direction of find figuring out how to uh, prove value in social media campaigns. And so I think we're going to see sort of how this year was. Uh, the IPO craze centered around social media companies. Yeah, I think the 2013 IPO craze is going to uh, center around uh, you know data-driven analysis of social media platforms. Do you think in 2013 we're going to see the types of IPOs that we've seen over the last year and a half? And by that, by that I mean we saw a lot of consumer-oriented technology companies. When you think about LinkedIn, Groupon, Facebook, etc. Obviously, there will be companies going public in 2013, but it seems like if I'm Twitter, for example, if I'm if I'm a high-ranking executive at Twitter, I'm looking at what's happened over the last year and a half, and I'm saying, you know what? To the extent that we can just postpone our IPO another one, two, three, five years, as long as we can stay private and grow without the glare of being a public company, let's do that. Yeah, there's a ton of benefit in that, and. Uh I really think it's all going to be opportunistic. It, it depends on what uh, the demand for these things are, because if you can, uh, you know, if, if everyone is is salivating over getting their hands on these IPOs, well, the people behind these companies are smart enough to realize that hey, this is a, you know, this is a rare lifetime opportunity to diversify my holdings, to cash in from, you know, and make paper profits real profits. Mm -hmm. um, however, with that said, if if People aren't salivating, chomping at the bit to get their hands on these these types of IPOs. Then, absolutely, I mean, Facebook held out basically as long as it it could, uh, and I think you'll see companies default to trying to stay private for as long as they can until unless there is a, a craze. Um, I want to talk about CEOs in just a second, but Joe, since you are in the room, um, and I know Apple is a company that you watch closely on a regular basis. A year ago, this time. Maybe the biggest question facing Apple was Tim Cook, and ha and and not just uh, and even though he had proven himself as a longtime lieutenant of Steve Jobs, I think it was perfectly legitimate to look at Apple and say, 
How is this company going to fare with Tim Cook as CEO in the post-Steve Jobs era? I think that question has been effectively answered. If you agree with that, then when you look at Apple heading into 2013, what is the big question you think hang- hanging over that company right now? I agree with you that Tim Cook is an excellent CEO. I think he's proven that. The question that remains for me is, is he an in- innovator? You know, Can he create new products, and his team as well? Can they create new products without Steve Jobs? And I think Apple will find success there, because they still have great managers. They still have Johnny Ive, you know, their head designer. Yep. So they, ha- they have a great team. Um, going forward, it's I think that's the question. Can Apple's new products that weren't influenced by Steve Jobs, can they continue to compete effectively? Can they maintain their kind of premium quality, their uh, coolness factor, mm. you know, and, and can they fight off competition from Android and now Microsoft as well? And Chris, I even wonder if the next new product that Apple comes out with, if we can even really attribute that to Tim Cook, or if, you know, that was probably in the works and very much has the fingerprint of, of Steve Jobs on it. So, I don't know that we're going to find that out this year. You think yeah, it's I agree. two, three years down the line? I think it's two, three years down the line. Um, one of my favorite questions uh, this time of year is uh, CEOs on the hot seat. And uh, I'm curious, Brian, who, who you think is on the hot seat, because uh, certainly there are plenty but you got to pick one. Yeah, so this is a little unfair. Um, but I'm picking Brian Kelly on from Green Mountain, and he is a brand new CEO. Uh, you know, Green Mountain just had their their most recent conference call, which was their their last with their their current CEO. So Brian Kelly uh, has been on the job for a mere number of hours at this point. <laughs> uh, but there is so much going on. Uh, there is so much speculation swirling around. I don't the think stock. that's unfair. <laughs> no, no, I truly don't. I mean, I, I get that he's been on the job for all of five minutes, but you know what? Comes with the job. Right? It, it, well, and and for Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, that's a you know that's there are a lot of expectations on both sides of the coin when it comes to that company and that stock and their business, and so yep. I think it's perfectly legitimate to say he's on yeah. the hot and, seat. And he's you know he's walking into uh, an embattled stock, one that is you know under investigation by the SEC, uh, one that you know investors uh, investors are. You know, questioning uh, whether or not you know the accounting is legitimate, mm-hmm. uh, but still a, a company with a, a great product that you know it's u- that users really, really, really like, uh, and a massive installed base. So he has an incredible asset with which he can work. Uh, but I just wonder, you know, what he is going to uncover when he starts picking up stones. I think. Brian Kelly, and I don't know anything about him, but my hunch is he probably knows he's on the hot seat. I, I don't think you take that job unless you go in with eyes wide open. Uh, Joe, who's your CEO on the hot seat for 2013? Steve Ballmer. You know, Microsoft has had a series of missteps from major purchases that have led to billions of dollars in impairment charges. Um, you know, obviously falling behind in the tablet and smartphone markets. And I think a big question in 2013 will be can Windows 8? start to claw back some market share from Android and iOS. And if it doesn't, I think a lot of investors are going to be clamoring for the replacement of Bomber. When you mentioned Apple and the question of can they continue to innovate over the next couple of years, it seems like, in some ways, Apple is an sort of a victim of their own success when it comes to innovation, because while I agree with you about Steve Ballmer, as a longtime Microsoft shareholder, I, I do agree with you. But it seems like while there are some people saying, gosh, Microsoft really needs to innovate, it, it almost seems like they are not under the same type of pressure that Apple is, just because Apple has proven they can do it time and time again. In yeah. some ways, Microsoft mm-hmm. is essentially forgiven for not really ever innovating something all that amazing on the consumer side. Yeah, I mean the bar is definitely set low at this point, you know, and f- so from that, if if they can exceed those expectations, the stock could react very favorably. Um, but I, I also kind of, when I look at the competition and I hear everyone question Apple, can they continue to innovate? Can they continue to compete? Uh, that's actually more where I kind of look at it and say, well, why does everyone question Apple? Why does everyone assume that Samsung is just going to blow right past them? Mm-hmm. You know, it's Samsung has the same challenges. They need to innovate. They need to out innovate Apple at this point going forward. So it's not easy for anyone. And my money's on Apple going forward. What's incredible to me is if this podcast were in existence four years ago, we we probably would have said Steve Ballmer is on the hot seat then as well. Yeah. So uh, you know, 
if you look at if you look at Microsoft's share price, there's probably reason to warrant that. Uh, but for whatever reason, this guy's like a cockroach, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so that raises a question: Why do we think he's in that position? Is it simply because? He is in the good graces of Bill Gates because it's, it's part of it. I mean, I'm I'm assuming if at some point Bill Gates came to Steve Ballmer and just sort of put his hand on his shoulder and you know like you know from on the waterfront you know just with the boxer and he's like it's not your night kid if he just if he just pulled him aside and like look Steve it's time to go <laughs> I think Ballmer would go but for whatever reason he, he that's not the case he has a large ownership of Microsoft as well which which protects him somewhat his his friendship. You know, with Gates as well. And I think Gates kind of gave him the mandate to defend Windows, defend the moat, defend the office. And to some extent, he's done that. But now I believe we're starting to see cracks in the Windows armor. You know, with Android's huge market share and kind of the convergence of devices, you know, PCs and laptops are kind of moving towards tablets and even smartphones to some extent. So now that we're seeing the cracks in that moat, I think there's there's going to be an increased urgency for, for Bomber to deliver. And if he doesn't, we could see him finally replaced. Let's move on to uh, stocks to watch in 2013 before we wrap up with reckless predictions. Um, Brian, what's uh, what's a stock or two that you're watching, whether you're watching it because uh, you think this is one to avoid, because you think this is one that is poised to take off? What are sure. you watching? So, I- I'll give you two. Uh, number one is a class that I'm watching, uh, leveraged ETFs and ETNs, so extra- exchange-traded funds or exchange-traded notes. There are a whole slew of these. Did Jeff Fisher send you into this studio <laughs> w- armed with non-stocks? When you told me, when you told me <laughs> that this was going to be the last one b- before the holidays, yeah. I knew I needed to give our, our dozens of listeners something to really chew on. Okay, for the fair next, point. Fair point. For the next couple of weeks. <laughs> so yeah, leveraged ETFs and ETNs. Uh, basically, these are exchange-traded products uh, that try to uh, mimic an index. Uh, but they do this using derivative products, and they try and give you either you know two or three times the performance on the good on the upside, or two or three times the performance on the on the downside. Anyway, these are really bad long-term investments. They're incredibly costly to manage that strategy, and so over time they e- they eat away and erode their own value. Um, so for long-term shareholders, these things are are a cancer. They are really bad. Um, I think they're they're it's likely that they are going to come under some scrutiny uh, by the SEC, uh, by Finra, by you know and various organizations who try and you know look out for the inv- individual investor. Um, so beware. The only people who really benefit from these are day traders and the companies that issue them. And the other the company that I'm really have have my eye on a stock to watch. Uh, is J.C. Penney, because I really have yeah. no clue what is going to happen there. Um, obviously, Ron Johnson has had problems so far, but if you have ever listened to his grand vision for commerce, for you know mall commerce, the guy is incredible. He is a visionary, um, and he's basically been been given an incredible amount of, of leeway and latitude to uh, to curate J.C. Penney into this experience, and I don't know if he's going to be able to do it. I was just going to say, is he going to run out of time? Because it seems like the the stores that he's converted this store within a store concept that he's trying at J.C. Penney. Reportedly, there was some success there, but it also seems like when you look at the footprint of J.C. Penney and how many locations they have, it seems like he is really playing beat the clock on this one. Yeah, and that's a great question because uh, so so you know Bill Ackman, Pershing Square, huge investor in J.C. Penney, uh, the guy who brought Johnson to J.C. Penney, uh, has basically taken the long term view here uh, and is, is willing to give him time. But even still, he's got investors, you know, who invest with him, who are going to have yeah. demands. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know. And it's a, you know, it it could be sort of if, if Ron Johnson isn't able to to turn this around. I mean, this could be, uh, it could portend real problems for mall mall based retail. Joe, what are you watching in 2013? Well, earlier we were speaking about the housing market, and then I mentioned that I like consumer-oriented stocks, and to kind of tie those two together, the reason why the housing market is important to consumer stocks is, well, for many reasons. It impacts the economy. You know, it creates jobs. It um, it has a wealth effect. As people see their prices of their homes rising, they feel more wealthy, and then they typically spend more. Um, it 
can also boost consumer confidence as well. All those factors play into, you know, kind of demand for, let's say, restaurants like Panera or uh, grocers like, like Whole Foods to some extent, on a, more on the premium side. So um, that, that's something I'm watching going forward. It's reckless prediction time. My, my favorite time. Um, one reckless prediction for 2013. It can be about the market. It can be about pop culture, music, movies, sports, anything. Brian Hinman, your reckless prediction for 2013. Self-serving. Here we go. Washington Nationals beat the LA Angels in the World Series. Wow. That would be great. And and re- why is that self-serving? It's self-serving because my wife works for the Washington Nationals, and I will get to go to all the games. You will get to go to all the games, but uh, I believe... Uh, you and I talked at the beginning of this last baseball season that your wife, as an employee of the Washington Nationals, uh, she would have the right to purchase a World Series championship ring. Yeah, this hurts, Chris. She told you, like, if if we win the World Series, you're buying me a ring. These wow. were these rings are no joke, and <laughs> no. she has she has she has informed me that uh, that I am I am incorrect in thinking that she is going to opt for the dainty female one. No. She wants the one that is, you know, essentially she, the size of like, you know, a, a small truck. That yeah. Would, that would. You she know. wants the big gaudy ring that oh, the yeah, players exactly. are going to get. Oh yeah. So it's only right. Save your so money I money. might, I might have, I might have to get a second job tending bar or something, but uh, it might be worth it. Joe, your reckless prediction for 2013. Reckless and w- which way are we going? Self-serving with this? Uh, yeah. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> I'm so. always in favor of that. So. I'm not sure this is reckless. This is more high level. I, I was saying uh, elite tier one businesses will continue to be outstanding long term investments. So uh, that's not, not reckless. Not reckless at all, but self serving because I, I happen to manage a real money portfolio that is titled Motley Fool Tier One. So, all right, that is self serving. <laughs> <That's> fair enough. <laughs> you went on the self serving side. <laughs> you went on the self serving. Uh, I, I hit uh, Bill and Tim with this yesterday just because we are taking this break. This is the last podcast of 2012. Uh, to help our listeners pass the time over the next two weeks. A book recommendation, Brian? Sure. Well, we always joke about how I sort of don't answer the question many times, so I'm going to answer the question that I want to and not give you a book. Fine. (laughs) (laughs) But it goes along (laughs) along with this, right? Because uh, I have my my eyesight is bad, and I stare at a computer screen all day. Uh, So giving a book recommendation or a book that I'm going to read uh, works against me. So... In 2013, I am going to do uh, yoga for your eyes. Now, this is this is a set of eye exercises by a doctor named Meyer Schneier, Meyer Schneider, excuse me. And I'm going to try and improve my own vision uh, by doing these eye exercises. Anyway, this this isn't a this isn't a book. It's a, it's a DVD called Yoga for Your Eyes. So I would like to throw out there to our dozens of listeners uh, an invitation to anyone who wants to join me in trying to improve their eyesight. Uh, and doing, how mu- doing yoga for your eyes. And how much does this snake oil DVD cost? <laughs> it's like fifteen dollars. Yoga like for that. your eyes? Are you kidding me, <laughs> oh, Chris? God. While you while you read Joe's Joe's book recommendation and do damage to your eyes, just know that my eyesight will be getting better. Okay, Joe, book recommendation. Well, Chris, this might make me sound like a company man, so I'll put that out there first. But uh, whenever people ask me for a book recommendation, I always point them to Motley Fool Rule Breakers, Rule Makers. It's a classic investment book. It, it really helped form the foundation of my investment kind of philosophy and style, and uh, it served me really well since I read it years ago, and I continue to reread it from time and time again. And fortunately for Brian, it's available in audio version. So <laughs> there you, you go. You don't have to won't, read it. won't hurt just, the eyes. You'll be set. P- put the CD Everybody in. wins. Listen to it. <laughs> um, we are back on January 2nd. Again, make sure you resubscribe on iTunes. We will be back. Brian Hinman, Joe Tenabruso. Happy New Year, guys. Happy New Year, Chris. Full on. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. That's it for this edition of Market Foolery. Our producer is Matt Greer. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on January 2nd.